morning, friends. I'm happy to see today a large number of students here, and also some faculty members spending your valuable time, morning time, to be here today. Very happy to see that. Um, one of my best phases of life, I would see when I was a student. And also, one of uh, my favorite place in a classroom used to be the last bench. <laughs> so you know the advantages of uh, sitting in the last bench. So whenever I see students, I recall my student days uh, where I have very sweet memories. Uh, I'm thankful for Professor Dr. Subramanian here for inviting me today to speak on intellectual property rights. That's the area where I practice. I've not taken any sessions, something like this, for the quite long time. I used to do that. So I may sound a bit rusty today, so you have to bear with me. Uh, today, before I start off, I have a question in mind. Why? If you look at the Global Innovation Index of about, say, 129 countries, all countries, developed, underdeveloped, developed countries, India stands <coughs> last year at about, I think, 56 rank. It, is, it has a rank of 56 among 129 countries. Why is it so? Why we are at such a below ranking as far as innovation is concerned? Probably you all know that who could be possibly number one? So who is number one? Is it US? UK? Switzerland is number one in Global Innovation Index. We know the population of Switzerland is just 85 lakhs. And they file about 45,000 patent applications in a year. We also file 40 to 45,000 applications here in India. What's the big difference between 1 and 50, uh, 52 or 53 now? Why is it that that country is top on the ranking list and why are we way down below? So that's a question that we have in mind. So as we progress uh, today with this session, probably we may come to know some of the reasons why we are here, why we are trying to scale up, how, how difficult it is to scale up this ranking list, how to make India is one of the most innovative countries in the world. Okay. You see this, that tells you all. See, when I started practicing as a patent attorney about 27 years ago, 28 years rather, I used to go introduce myself, say, look, I'm so and so, I'm a patent attorney. Uh, they used to wonder and ask me, who, what was that I was doing? That was the situation many years ago. But now things have changed. I could see many young lawyers jumping into this bandwagon called IPRs. If we, some of you thought, most of you would be interested in so. Now, 
So this is what I was mentioning. Why is it so? Okay, see here, factory two. We are combined with a country like Chile, Mongolia, Philippines, Costa Rica, so on and so forth. And Switzerland is number one. Let us look at this picture. Uh, today, sorry, uh, what I'm trying to share with you is not something from the book, uh, which you're all familiar, you read everywhere. Uh, what I want to share with you is some of the experiences and insights. Can someone identify this complex looking machine? It's a looming machine, weaving, textile weaving machine, where which is used, where you use those for use threads and form the fabric. This machine was invented in the year 1928 by a Japanese gentleman called Sakichi Toyoda. 1928. See, the invention here at that time was these machines when they were operated they used to be stopped quite often to replace those bobbins or the threads the bobbins they carry threads so they used to stop this machine replenish the bobbins with the threads and then continue the process so this gentleman came up with an idea saying that this machine could be used without stopping it. That is, you can replace those bobbins while the machine was working. That was his invention in the year 1928. During that time, Clark Brothers were one of the leading manufacturers of these machines in UK or England. He approached them, said that, look, this would be very useful for you. Why don't you take this? And one of the wisest things he did during that time was, before disclosing this to anyone, he patented this. Then Platt Brothers paid him one million yen. Imagine the value of one million yen in 1928. They paid him that money and purchase that in innovation and invention. So we will see what's the difference now. From Sakichi Toyota. And Sakichi Toyota, what he did with that money, he started a small company. And the rest is history. We know now, what is that company? What's that company? Toyota. So Toyota was formed from the seeding money which Sakichi Toyota gained by selling his one of his inventions. Invention need not be too complicated as textile weaving machine or any other modern engineering marvels could be as simple as this. A teacup with a potion stand where you can store your snacks or biscuits. That's a new idea, isn't it? So therefore, on one hand, we see those inventions which are far too complicated. And on the other hand, we see something as simple as this. Now, today we are going to look at uh, these areas. We start with tangible property, with which we are all familiar, and then we move on to our area of intellectual property. And then, what are the rights corresponding to the intellectual property? And then, territorial nature of this IPRs. Say like we see you know, uh, a street dog in one area, one street would not allow 
or the of the coming side. They, they are the king in this, on that particular street. So we have sort of a territorial nature or aspect to this intellectual property rights. So as students of law and lawyers, we know types of law that are there. I won't dwell on this much. So whenever you talk about intellectual property, there are these types, sorry, by tangible properties. You have real, such as land, personal, public, and private properties, with which are all the touch and feel entities. Now, uh, the right that is provided to an individual, the, that right is provided by law. Therefore, the law defines what can be sold, what can be purchased. But for the law definition, there is no value attributed to the property. Say, for example, in the earlier days of Soviet Union, where the communist regime was there, people had to live in houses which did not belong to them. It belonged to the state. Because law at that time in that country said so. Now, what is that right that they have? When law says, yes, this is the property, and in terms of that law, you become an owner of the property, there are certain appendant rights that come with that. What are those rights? Right to enjoy, right to sell, right to live, right to let, let out, so on and so forth, right to enjoy. These are the rights that come along with the title of ownership of a tangible property. Or you have movable property, you have immovable property, so on and so forth. So these rights are the positive rights, absolute rights that we are offered. Now, let's move on to intellectual property. So even though uh, I've been in this field for more than 25 years. I still struggle to define exactly what is the definition for intellectual property right. There are, I see various forms of definitions coming up, various examples. But still, this is a term which is something I would say very dynamic in nature. We cannot put them in inverted commas and say, yeah, that, this is the one thing. Okay, let me give you an example. There was a priest in Ireland, very dull priest, uh, God-fearing man. One day, at the time of the season, there was heavy, there were heavy rains and there was flooding. So he was inside the church along with other people. So flood waters rushed inside the church. And, uh, and then uh, rescue workers came and they said, come out, come out. Uh, floods are rains are very heavy, so you should come out. So he sent out all his people. He remained back. Then after a while, the flood waters again rose higher and higher. He went to the first floor and then rescue workers again came in a raft or boat. They said, please come uh, because the situation getting bad. Then he said, no, uh, I believe in God. I would stay back. So he refused to go with them. Then Still, the, when the level of the waters rose, he had to go to the top of the building and he was standing there alone. Then the rescue workers came down in a helicopter. They dropped down the ladder to him. Hey, look, this would be your last chance. Pick it up and come up. Otherwise, we would lose you. The priest didn't listen. He said, no. I have full faith in God, God would come and rescue me. So he remained. 
Unfortunately, water levels went up and he died. So after his death, he went to heaven. So he was furious with God, saying that I was so dedicated, devout, every day of my life to you, but you betrayed me. You did not save me from dying. Then God said, why do you say it like that? I had sent my boat. I had sent my helicopter. But you refused to come. So you made a choice of yours. How would I be made responsible for your choices? My dear friends, intellectual property rights is something like that. You have to make right choices to understand what is hidden behind that iron curtain. You have to see through it. You have to look at the value that is not visible to a naked eye most of the times. Right. Why? Because it is a creation of mind or knowledge. So therefore, it is also called something like knowledge groups. Look at the term knowledge groups. How to define this knowledge groups? Then we also know that intellectual property rights, these intellectual properties have tremendous commercial value. Imagine the windows. Can you tell me who first invented windows? Okay, let me give you options. Option A, Microsoft. Option 2, Xerox. Pretty clear options. One, two, or both? Microsoft. 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 Yes, 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 of course. Windows was originally invented by Xerox. But they did not innovate. Mark my words, I said Xerox invented it. Bill Gates innovated it. So the idea that came to the mind of uh, Xerox, it's a creation of mind, Windows. But who commercialized it and brought that product to the market and made billions? Which is Microsoft Bill Gates. So this is the power of your intangible assets. One person did not see anything there, like the priest. But other person saw everything. My friends, this is what the intellectual property is. Now, they say these goods are inexhaustible. Period. Can something be like that which can exist forever? Let me give an example. See, I have a football. And then I come out with a new material with which if I make a football, it flies much higher than what it used to be now. <coughs> that new material is an idea created by my mind. I know what that material is, how to make it. So I make that ball and then I sell it. So here, if you look at these things, there are two things here. One is something, creation, idea. Another thing is product, product of that idea. If I sell the product of idea, would that act take away from me the idea which is in my head? Not be the case. So in that context, they say, 
this IP intellectual property is inexhaustible. Now, second is non-excludable. See, when somebody takes a thing or diverse of me a particular thing or product, I'm losing the ownership. I'm no longer in possession of it. How can you say that it is still non-excludable? See, the idea that I have to make that new material for the football, nobody can take it up from my brain. It remains in my head. So therefore, it is non-excludable. You have to extrapolate this with the conventional tangible assets. Once you lose, you are dispossessed. And once you lose, they are excluded from you. Tangible assets are exhaustible. Okay. Now, what are the forms of this knowledge? What are the various forms of this knowledge? Like you have codified knowledge, tool knowledge, and personal knowledge. Let me take up this personal last one, the personal knowledge first. We all know Coca-Cola. The formula for baking Coke is only known to two people in the world. And they never travel together. One will stay put somewhere, and other person, other person will be traveling. If you happen to visit Atlanta in the US, uh, they will also take you there is a there is a sightseeing tour where you can go to Coca-Cola factory. It will also take you to the multiple levels of security. And after you all cross through inside, you will they take, they won't take you there. That's where the formula is kept. It's a very popular tourist destination in Atlanta, Coke. So imagine. That formula is known to others. What would be the state of Coke? See, Atlanta is most of the tangible assets in Atlanta, they're owned by Coca Cola. But if they lose that formula, Coke will not be in existence. So that is the value of this intangible asset. Why is it called personal knowledge? Because it is personal in nature. It's a great secret. It's a know-how, which is allowed to be known by very few people. Now, what is this tool knowledge? Tool knowledge is something that, by using my knowledge, I prepare this tool, or a device, or a product. So this is called the tool knowledge which I have. And similarly, codified knowledge. Codified, if somebody writes a book, a story, which is codified in a particular language that is non-functional in nature, and so it is called codified knowledge. And you also have, so these are the some of the types of intangible assets or the creation of mind to say so. Now this is what I have explained to them. Now when I say various forms of knowledge which is residing in somebody's head, how can these rights be protected? If some, something is inside your head, how can you protect those rights? So therefore, legal rights apply to the intellectual creation. How do we, how do, we do that? If you see the image here, uh, you have an invention inside your head. Then the product of this invention is outside, this idea. Now, the, the question here that requires to be answered here is whether the law protects this this or both. I 
I'll give you an example, one more. We all know Samuel Morse, who invented telegraph somewhere in the early part of uh, uh, 17, maybe later part of 17th century. In the year uh, 1809, this telegraph was invented in Bavaria, but ahead of uh, Samuel Morse. But the earlier person who invented in Bavaria did not seek any legal protection. So, Morse was able to make that invention work down. So, he was able to demonstrate how telegraph functions. So, here the legal protection is not for the person who invented much earlier, the person who innovated. Now, let us try and understand the differences between these two assets. Tangible assets, they have physical existence, chairs, buildings, all those tangible structures, no physical existence inside. Tangible assets are depreciated. Say, for example, if you buy a vehicle for some work, say, if uh, life of the vehicle is, say, say five years, so you spend, uh, uh, say, five lakhs for five years, you say, after five years, the cost, the value of this vehicle is zero, then accordingly, per year, your depreciation will be. Uh, one lakh or two lakhs. So the value depreciates as the time passes by. That's how the tangible assets are. Intangible assets, however, are amortized. So, for example, you take a patent, which is an intellectual property, intangible asset, which has a lifespan of 20 years. So the value is attributed and calculated for a period of 20 years and then the value is amortized. Then you have the tangible assets, easy to sell, difficult. <laughs> difficult. I repeat it, say difficult, difficult because there are only one in thousand inventions that are commercialized in the world. It's not an easy thing to say that like the way you can sell intang uh, tangible assets very, very difficult to monetize intangible assets. Cost can be easily determined. It's very hard to. So now we have a new field, or an emerging field rather, which is called IP valuation, uh, where many people are interested in uh, providing value to the intangible asset. Why is it so difficult? Say, imagine somebody comes out with a laser pointer which nobody has seen before, having multiple functions like this. Then he says that I can make and sell this. You tell me what would be the value of my invention. Because product is not sold yet. Uh, we don't know knowledge of what the other competing products in the market. We have no idea of what others are selling in this. I have no idea of how this product would be in the next five years or ten years. So how do you value this idea beforehand before it is converted into a tangible asset? That's the difficulty and the complexity involved in valuing, providing a value. Even if you provide value, that value is not a real value, but only the emotional value. So Example here, uh, vehicles, plants, here, patents, trademarks, designs, and copyright. Now, I have this for you, so you have to help me in identifying, tagging these assets. What type of assets are these? 
Cash. Sorry. Anybody uh, who can say it intangible? Medium. Don't worry, I can support. No one. Okay. No one. Fine. Furniture. Stock. Sorry. I have a shared document with me. Share. Is it tangible or intangible? Tangible. Document is tangible. But stock is tangible. Stock is tangible. Footwear. Fix the boss. Tangible. 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 Customer data. Tangible. And of course, license, license agreements, license to use. Now, we see here, even though they look so simple, at times we, if they would leave us pondering to say, hey, what is this? Is it really a tangible asset or tangible asset? The yardstick for differentiating generally that is used is touch and feel. If you touch something, you feel it, it's tangible. If you can't touch and feel it, that's intangible. So cash is tangible, furniture tangible, stock intangible, goodwill intangible, fixed deposit tangible, customer data, Intact. See, you, uh, I think some of your most of the experts here they use Instagram. You know what Instagram does with your data? If you know that, you would not use it. Why? Because the value that you don't know about yourself. But he knows the value. That is the tangible asset. Okay. See, if I run a company, I have a client list. Would I share this client list with somebody else, particularly with a competitor? Because that is the value that I attribute to my company. Tangible asset. Okay, let's move on. Let's look at this. IP rights reflect different characteristics and functions. So, as I said, difficult to put it in inverted commas because of different characteristics and, of course, different functions. What are these types of IPRs we will be seeing shortly? This is just a prelude. Now here, the most significant thing that we have to bear in mind is that the difference between the tangible asset and the intangible asset. There, we talked about saying that it is a positive right to own the property. But here, it is not a positive right. IPR is a negative right. For example, say, I come out with a new drug. Say, now coronavirus is everywhere. So I, I come out with a drug which can cure uh, this virus. I go and apply for a patent, I get a patent. The question here is, can I make and sell and administer this drug, say to people, say in India? Because I am the legal owner of my invention and I have a patent right to do so. Can I do that? Of 
else. If I compare with the positive right, if I own property, property is in my name, I can do whatever I want. Can I do the same thing with intellectual property? Let me give an example. Say I have a laser beam here. And if I use project this laser beam on a surface like this, you can see, but if I project it on a LED surface, I won't see this. So I come out with a new invention where in which I say this can be used on any surface. I file a patent, I get a patent right, can I make it such a problem? Now let us take the first example and also the second example to understand. In the first example, even though I have a patent right which is an IPR, which is a negative right, it does not give me an absolute right to make and sell. No. Because this drug has to be approved by the drug controller and other agencies to prove that this is safe and efficacious, so on and so forth. So I don't have absolute right to make and sell. But what is that that right hand is giving me that? Even though I cannot make and sell, it will prevent others from making and selling it. So that is what is the right which we call them, which we call it as a negative right. It prevents others, but it does not allow the owner to do it, but it prevents others. That's why it's called a monopoly right. It prevents others. In the second example, say this laser beam. First thing is whether is it safe or not. So they have to test and see and approve it, whether it is safe for humans or not. Then thereafter, yes, you can make and sell that. But it can prevent others from making it because I have a patent right. Prevent others. Okay. The second important thing is territoriality. The right that I have in one country is limited only to the particular country and it cannot be exercised in other countries. Say I come out with a new invention pen, sorry, this is common pen, where I say uh, this pen can write on any surface. So what I do is I make this product and I want to sell it. In order to sell this, it should have some name. So I, something I say, any right, I name it as any right, and then I start making it in India, then sell it with any right. My trademark for this is any right for this product. So after some time, I realized that any right for such a writing device is being used in other countries. Not in India, but other countries. So now I have a situation where I have been using this particular mark in India for some time. And I find some other person in other country where he has registered that trademark for his product in that country and using it. So there is an inherent conflict. Who is the owner? And how can I enforce my rights in that country where I have not sought protection for these rights in that country? So that's where the territoriality of intellectual property rights comes to. Okay? Now, let us look at patent rights. I have three questions. Now, A has a patent, say, in US for product X. First question is, can B, A has a patent, can B make and sell in India without infringing that patent? Any inputs for the first question? Can he do that? Yes, if A allows B to sell. So there is a patent in existence in US that product is made in India and sold. Is it okay? 
So if he Does has it given the allowance. Infringe? Does it not infringe the US patent? Yeah, it, it, it does, sir. There is no patent right in India, so it doesn't infringe. How do you apply the principle of territoriality here? US patent means it is the rights are confined to the territory of US geographical territory limits. So if somebody has a US patent, can he prevent, can he or she prevent somebody using that particular patent product covered by the patent in India? That's a question. The answer is no. There is no infringement, it is free. You can literally copy US patent in India, make it sell it, nobody can stop you. Because patent laws are territorial in nature. Unless that particular patent has a corresponding patent in India, unless nobody would stop. Nobody could stop that. That's the territoriality limitation. Second question. Can we export X to US without infringing that particular patent? No, so I make in India because US, that corresponding patent does not exist in India. I make it. Well, jolly well I can do that. So I export because I have big money there. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Exporting the product into a country where patent rights exist. <laughs> The moment I export, it lands there, there will be an act of infringement. Not in India, but in the US. Let's answer the third one. Can we export to European Union without infringing that US patent? I do it in Europe. Eh? You have in US. I go to Europe and do it. Can I do that? Yes, sir. Yes, no, no, no. Yes, sir. Yes. Europe is a different territory, different sovereign country or the sovereign countries. US patent right cannot be extended to you. Somebody may say, hey, I can have a global patent. So that one patent I can sue anybody anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, as of today, we don't have anything like global patent. But we have European patent, which can uh, provide protection across the euro so on so so okay the last question here can we manufacture x in china and sell it in india before we put us part yes sir why not sir see here two different countries i don't make it here i make it in china but sell it here can i do that yes sir you know the answer so that is the importance of significance of Territorial nature of IPRs. Because I'm not going much, much deeper into that. As a lawyer, you all know when there is a law, exemption is not far behind. Right? So let us not get into that. Because there may be time when we specialize in that particular field, probably we can look into those aspects. But what are these various types of IPRs? Uh, patents can be for new improved products. These are inventions. Please mark this word invention because I will be using it more often from here and I will be mixing this with the term called innovation. I know these terms are used in common parlance interchangeably. People call it, hey, this is an invented new product. This is a very innovative product, so on and so forth. But as a practitioner, uh, we all should know the, what's the finer distinction between uh, invention and innovation. Okay, now we have uh, designs. This is also one of the types of intellectual properties. This is nothing but a design. It really would like this. Visually appealing, appealing to eyes. There is no functional value to it. 
but it looks nice. So therefore, looking nice is also a form of knowledge which could be protected even if they have no functional life. Only, the, only for the looks you pay for. Right? This is also a desire, an intangible asset, which could be protected. I wonder who would love to sit on this, but it makes you to look at it again and look something different. Right? Swiveling chair. Till now, I was emphasizing a putting up a word here saying that non-functional in nature, only non-functional things can be protected as design. But here, can't this be a non-functional design? It is a chair which has a function of sitting it, it has a swirling, so on and so forth. Therefore, functions are attributed to this. But still, you can protect the non-functional features of a functional product. It can be. Like the way it looks, it looks good. You can. This looks a so simple design, and uh, in order to enforce this, Apple and Samsung spent 10 years fighting each other. Apple and Samsung fought 10 years to protect this simple design for a smartphone. Okay. Now, let us look at the other type of copyright, which we are all familiar with the copyright. What is this copyright? It's very simple. Right to copy. If I write a book, I only have right to copy. I, I only have right to reproduce. I only have right to publish. That's what I have. But this right is not for the idea per se. Ideas are protected by patents, but copyright protects only the expressions of the idea. Let me give an example. Say we all know Ramayana, right from Valmiki to Ramana and Saga. Yes. We have seen various versions of Ramayana. The idea remains same even today. Characters remain same in that even today but different versions. These versions are nothing but different expressions coming from different sources. So each expression is capable of getting a copyright for the same idea. Now, we have trademarks. You can see this here. Uh, trademarks is a type of idea which provides protection for source or origin of goods. See, if I go to any uh, shopping place, say I want to buy TV. I, at the moment I enter, the shop owner would tell me, yeah, you have these all options, you have Samsung, Philips, uh, Sony. So, I say, no, I want to buy only Sony. He says, sir, I don't have stock right now. I can arrange that for you, some other product, which is much cheaper than this. No, no. So, uh, then I say, no, 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 I want to buy only, am I audible? Yes, sir. I want to buy only so. Why I'm so insisting on that? Because in my mind, I attribute certain linkage. If I buy Sony, I know it is made by Japanese. I believe in Japanese technology. So therefore, I have certain sort of assessment in my mind. So I go by that. So the brand creates a certain relationship or association between the product and the buyer. This association is something very, very important because mind plays many ways. There are different ways of perceptions with which 
a human associates his idea to something. Let me give you one example. There is a ballet college in Oxford. It so happened that there was a dean there, very elderly person. And that particular college provides good scholarship for students. And the dean was very strict. And he wanted only those students who are not only knowledgeable, but ethical in nature. So he wanted to fit around those persons coming for interview, removing all those non-ethical candidates. So how, how he planned to do that? He devised a test called test of association to judge the character of a candidate. So one candidate comes, he started testing. Then he said, he gives a name called Gordon. It's in UK and London. So in London, Gordon means it is uh, it goes with something called sin and mixes with tonic, nothing but gin. Very famous brand. And that boy, the moment he gets this name Gordon, hey, yes, yes, sir, I know. He was a martyr who died in South Africa or Africa. Then the dean raises another question. Then he said, Craig. Craig is in UK, it's uh, also a brand for Scotch music. Then this boy says, Yeah, yes, yes, I know. Uh, this is who was a general in World War I, Alexander Craig. Dean was surprised. And he could not believe this guy because he was looking smooth, smart. He could not believe. So he said, okay, let me. Then he puts a final question to him. He asked him, VAC 69. Then the boy thinks for a while and responds like this. He says, uh, isn't it a four number of Pope? Vatican, no? so he thought uh, uh, VAC 69 is something. So he said, isn't it the four number of Pope? So now the thing here is, look at the association of a particular name that creates an impression in the minds of people. Trademark is nothing but it creates such an association between the fire and the cell or the man Okay? Oh, now, finally, we have the strict city. So I've given an example of a book. See, in India, in Bangalore, we have, when I was small, uh, my Mother used to give me uh, whenever I had some problem with digestion, leaf 52 tonic. It is still in existence, leaf 52, which is made by Himalaya drug manufacturers. Have you ever thought why is it that there are no other similar products which is similar to leaf 52? Chadak also has a drug which is very similar to the Himalaya sleep of the two, but they are not as popular as the two is nothing but a trademark. It is said that when this drug is manufactured by Himalaya, the team goes to Himalaya uh, region to collect those herbs. These herbs are collected at a particular season of the year they bring back and they have certain novel method with which they make the drug which nobody knows. So it is a trade secret of Himalaya. So this is another type of right, way we call them as trade secret. Uh, but trade secret is a secret as long as it is a secret. When the cat, once the cat is out of the bag, gone, there is no protection. In India, we don't have a law to protect trade secrets. Whereas in US, they have a law to protect trade secrets. Okay.
So we have uh, we have seen the types of uh, those things like the property rights, and we can see here uh, we have laws, statutory laws to protect those rights. We have Patents Act, Designs Act, Trademarks Act, and Copyright Act. Now, what is this patent? Patent is nothing but a deal, an agreement between the state and the subject where they say, you share with me your invention, I will give you a protection for a limited period of say 20 years. That means for this period of 20 years, no other person apart from you can make you sell this particular product. Possibly. So therefore, this is a negative right which prevents, as I explained. So once you have a patent, so then you make it, this is the US patent document, this is India, and this is probably a very old ancient one uh, patent document, let us patent. So you'll be awarded with patent, right? Now, can somebody tell me, this patent is given for invention or innovation? I don't need an answer right now, maybe as we proceed further, so that I can complicate these things terms further, so that we can tell me. So just keep in mind that the patent right is given for invention or uh, an innovation. So what is that right I get? This is the exclusive right to prevent others, right? So this is a negative right. This I have explained already. Ah. What are the golden rules to get a patent right? You can't be a tortoise in getting patent right. You have to hurry up once you have an invention. You have to see how to protect it and get the protection. Otherwise, somebody else will overtake you. Rights, patent right is not provided for the person who invented first. It's not. But who secures the protection first? You have to tell rabbits, smart rabbits. Okay. Then, ideas alone are not protectable. Please bear in mind the term invention and innovation. See, when somebody comes up with an idea in his mind, that remains an idea. Unless he puts that into practice and converts that into a commercial product or process having commercial value. So when that invention reaches that stage, that becomes innovation. Let's proceed. So patents for inventive creation, not for discoveries. Again, I've added some one more word here, discover. I discovered this. I invented this. So we keep hearing these words. Then what is the difference between a discovery and an invention? Can somebody tell me what is the difference? Right, which is already in existence but I discovered Columbus discovered United States of America would anybody say Columbus invented United States of America can somebody say I invented aluminum discovered is it right or can I, if somebody says, I discovered bauxite and invented aluminum. No, bauxite is, a, is an ore which is naturally in existence. I discovered that and made aluminum from it. Aluminum becomes invention, bauxite becomes a discovery. When I use a garlic to treat some ailment, 
usage of garlic is it invention or discovery? No comments on that. So we see five series. Or I take this turmeric and use it as a wound healing property. So I apply my human intellect to it. I can call it as invention. Who is going to stop? I live with you. Right, okay. Now, how do you get this pattern? Right. So, here, here you are here. You have to work out your invention, draft it, to give it to somebody like me. Right? And then, he will prepare the application, you will file it. Patent examiner in India, it is Indian Patent Office, Government of India. And then, you get a grant. You know how long this takes? Sir, two to three months. Any guess? Sir, two to three months. I think anybody, any pattern holders here? No, sir. Don't worry, I am also not here. See, it used to take minimum of 10 years, some years back, from here to here. But now, things have changed drastically, so we are able to get to four years. Okay. Now you have to help me in a drafting a claim for a patent application. This is a simple looking chair. All right. Why? Because it is an intellectual property. You have to define meets and bounds. Like say, if you have a property, say 30, 40 side, you may say north is born by this, south is born by that, blah, 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 you say, and then you get a protection for that. How do you define intellectual property? How do you define boundaries by way of claims? So, how do you define a claim? How do you define this as yours? Okay, I do like this. A chair having a seat with four legs and a backrest attached to the seat. So I am defining my property here, saying that this is what is my right ease. Is it okay? For a normal person who is very honest and say, yes, this is what I have, so this is what I want to claim. As well. <coughs> To the exclusion of others. That means others cannot make and sell this. As long as they fall within the language here, but not the product, you cannot compare the product to establish infringement, but you can only compare with the claim. It can be anything. As long as the infringing product does not fall under this language, there is no infringement. That's the law. We all know. Now, there are smarter guys than me. So, in order to avoid this language, he makes this. Does it infringe this claim? It may not, because there is no backrest here. But my claim says you should have this, this, and a back. So, if I make a product or a chair without a backrest, it is not infringing my this particular claim. I realize my mistake. So what I do, I amend my claim. I say a chair having a seat with at least a leg. That means it covers this and also this. So I become wiser. Okay. Somebody comes out with this hanging chair, which has no legs. So whether the problem is whether a chair having a seat with at least the leg infringe this? Probably not, because there is no there are no legs here. Okay, then I say a seat position horizontally in space. <laughs> Dear friends, what I'm trying to why I'm showing this because Pattern drafting is an art. And 
this is a very, very important type, one of the important types of intellectual property rights where you protect inventors' inventions. How do you protect them? By defining the case. Look how challenging it is. If for a simple product like this could have as many implications, imagine drafting a claim or claims for a complex product. Right? And this is the value of intellectual as a fact. Patent drafting is also very, very intensive and uh, a careful exercise because you are handling uh, a baby of others. And every word that you use, every full stop and comma that you use in the claims, they do matter. So I still remember I worked with Japanese companies. Uh, one of the companies, uh, they sent an application for filing. So, some company, Hitachi Company Limited, comma, CO, comma, Limited. So we filed it. Uh, they came back and said that, no, 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 you committed a big blunder in putting your name of the company. Then I said, what is it? Uh, you have placed comma in place of the full stop. So I want that full stop, CBO, full stop, LPD, full stop, fine. Well, that sounds silly, but the fact of the matter is, you have to be that much of this in drafting that application. So here, here the uh, person who is the wife of a sailor, uh, sailor goes on ship on a wire, so she gets worried. She goes to priest and tells him, look, uh, my husband has gone, uh, gone on voyage, uh, so I'm worried about his uh, welfare. So why don't you say uh, prayer for him? So the priest was in hurry, so when he was dictating, he said like this, uh, John having gone to see his wife, desires prayers for him. The intention was this. Look how, what happened here. My dear friends, this is what happens with the patent claims. Product would be something else, your claims would take it, define something else. So it's extremely important that you have to be in the same wavelength of inventors. You have to think, place yourself in the shoes of inventors, then only you can justify the protection for the product or the invention. Okay, good so far. Let us look at trademarks. Uh, it provides uh, identity for the ownership and quality, which I explained. Look at this. Does Google manufacture any product? Does Microsoft, you know, Microsoft manufactures a lot of products. Look at the market capitalization of Google and Microsoft. They are 164 billion and Microsoft is 204 billion. So without making any very major products, Google is market capitalization is almost similar to Microsoft. Brand value of Google, this trademark, is 44 billion dollars, which is almost 27% of market capitalization of the company. Look at the value of intangible assets coming up to 30 percent. What is the 30 percent? Can you touch and feel the 30 percent intangible assets? That's the value. Apple, 29.5 billion trademark. Startup, 30 thousand dollars. Mahindra, 3 thousand million dollars. So you can have names as trademarks like Bajaj, Tata. You can have coined expressions, inventive expressions like Verizon, Exxon. Nothing to do with products. Verizon is a uh, telephone company. Like Kodak, Kodak is inventive expression. 
You can also have numbers for trademarks. You can also have letters, logos like this, combination of letters and logos. You can also get trademarks for shapes, slogans, of course, songs. See, uh, if you go into a shop of a Verizon, I think it is from the US, you get a very unique uh, aroma <coughs> when you the inside the showroom. That is the trademark of Verizon. Right? They have a trademark on this one. Okay. Now, I'm, I know that you can hear this sound, let me try. So, you can also protect uh, songs for a roar of a lion. Here, the roar of a lion is uh, 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 for MGM. You can see the NGM the cricket club, you can see the lion roar. So, they have protected, they try to protect the song of the lion. Uh, unfortunately, Europe, in Europe, that particular sound mark was rejected. They said, the notation that you have provided because you have to represent that song. Now, how do you know that? So they have provided something like this. They said you cannot, I cannot identify the mark with the notation. So they said so. So there is a uh, uh, difference in levels of protection for these unconventional marks in various countries. Let us not get into that. Okay. Now you can also have coin expressions like Pepsi, arbitrary ones. Apple has nothing to do with computers. Suggestive Jaguar, it shows that it's speed and also the strength, nothing to do with pass. Descriptive also, laser gaze, something like this. You can also have names. So, like in Britannia, Yahoo, Yahoo, you know, you can, you know how the Yahoo sounds comes. So, all these things are protected. As a what is she doing here? Uh, probably the smiles I get, probably you know the background of this. Do you know the background of this? How many of you are. Uh, I hope I'm an audible here. That's it. Uh, how many of you? Are interested in taking selfies? Okay, can, can somebody name this monkey here? Sorry? Yes. Okay, let me name it. Naruto. You want to tell the story behind it? It's a, it's a monkey business, right? In the year 2011, one photographer from Great Britain called David Slater, uh, he visited uh, an Indonesian island for solar racing. He is a wildlife photographer, and his idea was to capture wildlife. Particularly, he was interested in capturing the images, photos of monkeys. So he went there and started capturing photographs of monkeys. Then he found that these monkeys were very shy. Uh, they were not allowing him to take a picture in a very close manner, on a, in, a, in a natural way. So he tried several ways and he failed. So once what he did, he created a tripod and kept his camera on the tripod and left. So the monkeys were very curious. They came and then started uh, fiddling with the cameras and then taking pictures. But those pictures also were not so clear because of some issues. So he adjusted the focus and they kept the camera there. And one such monkey 
uh, came forward and uh, the monkey took a selfie. This was the image. And uh, uh, David was very excited. He said, uh, what a fantastic image of a monkey I got, black matak monkey. Uh, practice. So he got this photograph and gave it to uh, National Geographic channels. So they published it. It went wire. The photograph became wire. Then Wikipedia posted this image on their website. Probably still there. You can, if you go to Wikipedia, you can see this another boy that says. So it became so popular. And he made good money out of this by selling this photograph, by endorsing this photograph. Then there's an organization called PETA, that is Prevention of Ethical, some cruelty for animals, PETA or something. They protested against the David's uh, this thing. And uh, they filed a case against uh, David for commercial exploitation of this photograph. See, under copyright law, whoever takes the picture is the owner of the copyright. Because photographs come under expression of ideas. So therefore, they are copyrighted. And uh, so uh, David said, see, this particular photograph was enabled by me. So I enabled that monkey to take that particular photograph. But uh, the other side argued saying that this particular picture was taken by a monkey using its own skin. So this case uh, went up to the US court in California. Uh, the judges and the lawyers, they were all thinking what sort of monkey business is coming to the court. Uh, there were many, many monkey jokes. Uh, then the court dismissed this case, saying that enough is enough. Uh, monkey cannot be a subject of law. So then the court said, uh, whatever, then after this dismissal of the case, uh, the PETA and uh, David, they arrived at the settlement saying that the, David would pay 25% of the royalty to the organization. That money would be used for those herd of monkeys in Indonesia. Right? And then the fact of the matter is now today is that uh, David is still contemplating to sue Wikipedia. For what? For copyright infringement. Well, that's about the monkey's business. <laughs> See, uh, here too we thought intellectual property belongs to humans. Right? But now, uh, even though it has a territorial limit, saying that my right cannot be used in other countries in a very limited period of time. But now we have a new feature where hey, if you have an intellectual property right, uh, please also consider something which is not human. Right. I can tell you something more. There was a case in European patent office where a patent application was filed, not by a human, but by a machine. Artificial intelligence. So he said this invention was invented but not by a human but a machine. So therefore machine should be treated as inventor. Well, too many things, too many things. Uh, well, uh, now let us see the law. Copyright. Uh, I'll try and finish off quickly, please. So uh, copyright is a created uh, for original ideas, not for the idea but expression of ideas. As I said, what are those rights? So you have this bundle of rights under copyright. It provides protection for 
preventing others from reproducing your work. Please. These are the rights. You can be owner only can reproduce, make copies, perform, make film, translation, adaptation, etc. But these are the rights. So if these rights are infringed, then there is an infringement, violation of copyright. So the exception here is that if somebody uses for the purpose of private use, including research. So it's all applicable to all. If you use a copyright material for research purpose, here in this institution or outside this, does it amount to copyright infringement or not? Secondly, reproduction of short passages from published works, the act itself says, yes, it is allowable. What do you mean? How do you define short passage? It is one person, two person, five person, ten person, fifty person. If you take up, uh, say, ten pages from the original book, uh, is it a short passage which allows you to make uh, copies of that? Okay. So we have also a section which says the production of a work by a teacher or a pupil in the course of instruction. By, while giving lecture, if the lecturer reproduces such a material which is under copyright, is it allowed or not? So, under fair dealing or fair use, the Copyright Act allows. To what extent? All these things we know. Now, let's look at the, uh, this case, I've just brought it before because I think you must be aware of this case. Uh, significance of copyright for educational institutions. In this case, uh, this is about uh, Oxford Press. Uh, they sued uh, Department of uh, Economics, School of Economics in Delhi University. For what? For uh, copyright violation. Because uh, on the campus, they had this photocopying machine, uh, which was used to reproduce the copies of publications of Oxford Press. And those publications were used by uh, students. And uh, uh, how they, they were doing it? By way of course packs. Uh, course pack is something like, you, know, you take a photocopy of a book, and then you do the spiral binding, and then you circulate and reproduce as many as you want. It's a common practice. Even when I was a student, I used to get those photocopy versions of originals. Right? And Oxford pursued Delhi University for copyright infringement, saying that you have violated. Then, this was the agreement between the photocopier and the university, which allows them how you do it for the university. They say uh, you will charge 40 paise per page. This page will be of superior quality. And you, you do like this. So, there was an agreement between uh, the department and the photocopier in copying that original version into many copies. Okay. Now, question here was, is photocopying of an original copyrighted version amounts to uh, reproduction? Because reproduction is a copyright. Then, but the second question was, is reproduction in the course of instruction, in the course of teaching, whether it was done that? In order to answer these questions, the uh, Delhi court referred to the other decided cases. One was uh, this publisher Basic Books versus Kiko, where they said reprinting even portion of the books, uh, sorry, amounts to copyright infringement, and they award a damage of two million dollars against that uh, printing company in the U.S. And in UK, there was a similar case where they said Cambridge University versus Becker making course pack without permission of the owners is permitted, subject to a fair use of threshold of ten. The book has 200 pages, so 10 percent of it, they say you can make it, you can reproduce, not beyond that. If you do beyond that, there is an infringement, even if it is used in the course of instruction. 
Okay. In Canada, they said this is the case. Post pack fall within the purview of uh, a private study or research. Therefore, it is allowed. Okay. Now let us look at this case. When this case came up, uh, Delhi University produced this data. It says, uh, you see here pages copied here and uh, from the books here of the Oxford Press, it amounted to 8.81%. By citing that uh, UK case, they said, look, it is within the threshold of 10%, therefore there is no copyright issue. Then, uh, in the Delhi High Court, the single judge, when the case was brought, in the initial, that is admission stage, they got, uh, Delhi High Court grant injunction against Delhi University. They said, yes, injunction was granted. Then during the trial, then there was a lot of arguments between plaintiffs and defendants. Ultimately, it was decided by the court that uh, post pack uh, Copyright Act permits photocopying of copyrighted works for the preparation of post packs, irrespective of the quality, as long as it is for the purpose of educational instruction. And thereafter, uh, there was a compromise arrived between Oxford Press and Delhi University. The matter is more or less settled. But uh, don't take this case into account and say, oh, I can do as many copies and do whatever I want. But that, that there is a risk. And, uh, don't also quote me one lawyer came and suggested this case. They said, you use this case and use make as many copies as you want. No, please. This is a case which highlights uh, the significance of copyright and the way we reproduce copyright subject matter for educational purposes. Okay. Now, what are the importance of here? Let me quickly go through this. If you don't have intellectual property with you, you, you will get into the disputes and uh, you cannot cross license. Say for example, if, if Samsung was not having any IPR, Apple would have bulldozed Samsung. Because Samsung had patents, so therefore they were able to sit across and negotiate. Okay, I'll give you this, you give me this, so let us all both make money. And uh, if you don't have IPRs, they can be lifted. And uh, you can also, there's no guarantee that your product is uh, legally uh, free from dispute. And uh, you cannot, difficult to expand business internationally. And most importantly, uh, IPR is like a reward for the inventive capability of some employees. So just to conclude, So IPRs create and protect creative ideas and expressions. Protection of IPRs, you should be a combination. Say for example, this particular product uh, can have patent, design, trademark, copyright, all bundled together. Right? And unless you monetize IPR, it would remain as an invention, but not an innovation. Okay. Monetization of IPR protection, enforcement, monetization is a very capital intensive. It requires strategy, it requires direction, and the right direction. Right direction is very important because it has to be integrated with the business strategy. For example, say, uh, when I got married, that was 90s, 90s. Uh, my wife is from Chennai. So in those days, we had only scooters. So my wife was sitting behind me and we were going to meet one of the relatives in those days. I was new to Chennai and I'm not familiar with the roads at all. So we traveled, started. After one hour or so, I asked my wife, saying that, is it the correct way to go? So she was also a little nervous and said, okay, let us ask somebody. So he stopped. 
asked the gentleman saying that, say, we wanted to go to the KK Nagar. Uh, is it the correct way? Uh, then he gave me one answer, which still I remember. Uh, if you take the way that you go, it is about uh, 500 kilometers. Uh, if you turn back, it is about 20 minutes. So we were riding, riding on in the wrong direction. Right? So it was the property right to something. You need a strong navigator uh, who can navigate uh, and take these inventions to become innovations. Right? So that's it. So uh, thanks a lot for your patient time and listening to me.